Hello everyone, this is CJ Novo 992 and today we are back with another brand new video. Now I actually don't need to do the introductions for today's video because my man for heart and hand David Edgar does that for me in a couple seconds but before we actually jump into today's video I just want to say last month's reaction to the podcast was unbelievable and I greatly appreciate all the support so we're here for another monthly review and if you do enjoy the video de definitely just dive into the comments and share your opinion. It's all about this conversation here on this channel so I'd love to know your opinions on the points that's on the actual screen. Again, on the screen there's not going to be anything to watch apart from today's topics, but this is one of these videos you just sit back, put your feet up, drink your tea, drink your coffees, drink your bovros, whatever tickles your fancy, and just enjoy listening to the Rangers fans talking about Rangers things. So without any further ado, over to you David. Hello everyone and welcome to episode two of the Rangers Review. This is a show where some voices from various Rangers fan media get together to have a discussion about all the thing that's been happening to our beloved team. Joining me, David, from Heart and Hand, is, as always, the wonderful Mr Stephen Clifford from Four Lads Had a Dream. Hello, Stevie. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. You're not. You've you've clamoured at your sickbed. You've heroically um, got got up and got out and got ready to, to show up. You, you, you've taken, like, a painkilling injection to be here this morning. I would love to say all that was true, but I'm actually still in my sick bed. I'm, <laughs> I'm basically cuddling my laptop, hoping that I get through the next 45 minutes. That's a work ethic we're all so that's proud of on here. That's, that's, that's what it's after. And joining us from his wonderful YouTube channel, it's CJ Novo. Hello, CJ. Hello, mate. We're Stevie's uh, cuddling his laptop in a sick bed. I'm just cuddling it because I've just woke up. Two different yeah. flips of the coin. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's uh, perfectly. We are recording on a Sunday, and then what did God give us International Week Sundays for, if not to sleep? And <laughs> delighted to welcome to the pod, making uh, his debut this month, is Tommy McIntyre from the tremendous This Is Ibrox podcast. Hello, Tommy. Hi, guys. Afternoon, and I can't uh, quite conjure up the uh, the image that the guys have managed to paint of their own circumstances. Uh, I'm sitting in a comfy chair, uh, fully dressed with no bowel issues. So, uh, yeah, there we go, let's crack on. There's no need to boast. Sorry. I know. Uh, so you, you'll see that all my bowel movements seem to come from the front end, uh, from the mouth, uh, over the next 45 uh, minutes, obviously. Yeah. Well, luckily, gents, uh, I think that's about as much shite as we'll need to talk about today, yeah. because Rangers <laughs> have been really, really good for the last month. Stevie, we joked when we did this last month, saying, my God, this was like a moan-free episode. I dare say that won't last. I certainly didn't think it would last the entire month, but since we last recorded at the start of October, Rangers have been almost perfect, with the exception of, of 15 rather rubbish minutes at the end of a match in Benfica. And if that is our biggest moan, Every month that we come together, that we were a wee bit uh, disappointed that we didn't go and cuff, let's face it, a Champions League side in their own midden after playing them off the park. It's not going to be a bad year, is it? It's really not. Um, I'm almost frightened to kind of say just how well we've, we've been doing because, you know, you don't want to um, jinx anything, but the, the team have been above and beyond the expectations. Um, I think last time, we all tipped them to still be top of the league and um, we tipped them to have done well in Europe. But if you had asked us quite how well, I'm not sure we would have said. Um, I think when we left it last time, it was exact, more or less exactly a month ago, David. So we were just coming up, obviously, to our trip to Celtic Park and that just set us off. And the team have been exceptional. Really, really can't speak highly enough of everything they've done and yeah they, they had a, a small blip at the end of Benfica but as you say um, they were a magnificent side and, and the way we played that night some of our football was sublime so it's not one that I would be getting overly upset about CG did you know we've, we've talked about this that domestic football for this season is the, the be all and the end all for us and Rangers have just been I, I think quietly moving on week after week taking on all comers, dispatching them pretty tidily, pretty easily, all built from the back. But after a few weeks of saying, well, you know, the attack hasn't been firing the way it can. No, it's been played badly, but, you know, we've been winning, but it hasn't been doing what it... We see them all get back to form and, and, and that cuffing against Hamilton Ackies. 
And, it, you know, we're Rangers fans. We've, we've been kicked in the nuts so often the last few years that, that we instinctively sort of don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But no doubt where we are sitting here today, just looking back over this, this short period, we couldn't really have asked for a hell of a lot more. Absolutely not, mate. And I, I just thought I was I really loved the Hamilton game, not only just because we absolutely destroyed them 8-0, but it was the, the ruthlessness and the, it was almost the, the bullying kind of way the old Rangers team used to do at Ibrox. When a team would come to Ibrox, they would just get ran over. And I just like that Gerard's trying to bring that back. Even at three, you can hear him screaming. Four none, you can hear Tav grabbing the ball and telling the boys to get back because they want me and me. And I just like that aggressive, ruthless attitude that Stephen Gerrard's clearly put into the players. And I think we saw it come in there because the last time Hamilton was at Ibrox, we all know what happened. So I think that was a wee message to get sent there and to, to right or wrong. And we, we certainly did that. Tommy, as as CJ says, they're one of the things that that has been impressive with this Rangers team has been, if you like, the focus. Uh, it, it it's something that the manager's spoken about a lot over the last couple of years, and we have seen in patches from this Rangers team. But this feels like the most consistent run that they've put together. I, I don't know if it's something that's quantifiable. I suppose results are the ultimate the ultimate arbiter of this, but. They just seem to be carrying themselves differently to me. They seem to have, for want of a better word, almost grown up as a side in terms of things like belief and confidence. Uh, and, and belief and confidence not only in themselves, but in each other as a team. I think you're absolutely I think you're absolutely right there. Um, and drawing together a, a thread of, of what uh, CG and, and Stevie were saying as well. You know, you look at that block of fixtures, let's say post, but including the old firm game, you know, you've got roughly what, nineteen scored, three conceded. Um, going away to the likes of Parkhead and Leeds and stuff like that as well. If you come out that and your only gripe is you know three three with Benfica, uh, and their patch is no bad thing. But you, you're absolutely right. There does seem to be a belief that not only can the squad answer the questions put in front of them from different teams, and I think Stephen Gerrard had, had talked on this as well. But also there is no drop off in quality when the rotation starts. So when new people are added into the squad, it's still the same slick operation. There's still the same level of quality and the players are continuing to deliver. And I think that's probably the, the change there. Everybody keeps looking for the, the blip, get the people outside the club. Um, but we've been ruthlessly consistent, if I kind of bastardise uh, CJ's kind of comment there. And I think that's the difference. It bleeds through into the squad and it feels like a squad that's, really at its its kind of apex in terms of performance right now and there's no drop off when new people come into it. I think that's key. I think so too. Uh, I think we we talked about squad depth and I think we've we've done it the last couple of seasons. But for me, Stevie, this is the first time I feel that when we uh, that's the first time I feel confident that we can rotate rather than just, well if he's out, we've got somebody who'll do, which is a different thing. Uh, this is the first time since Gerard's been there and I think he feels the same way. Um, given by the, the 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 fact that he's been willing to change for certain matches, I think this is the first time where we can say, well, we can leave him out today to give this other guy a game, but we won't be significantly weakened. No, I think one of the main um, kind of positions when you look at that has has been probably Borna Barisic in terms of if he was missing last season, um, then we were all flapping and, and that left side kind of completely collapsed in terms of what he could offer but you look at Calvin Bassey coming in young, fit, hungry, strong looking you know, to make an impression and likewise when Hollander takes a, a break and Balogun comes in or the rotation in midfield has, has been incredible so yeah, there's, there, there hasn't been a drop off and I think that's something maybe Stephen Gerrard is, is a wee bit conscious of a, a possible burnout after you know, after Europe does go, because that does take a lot out. But you know, we've been to some incredible places, and then and then went to the likes of Kamarnik and stuff, and managed to grind out results. But there's something else that I've been impressed about with this side, David, and it's not in terms of, um, you know, yes, they have been ruthless and taking chances and things like that. But I think that the way that they've been able to to game manage, albeit with the exception of of Benfica, um, situations and and. And not play attacking football in, in, in certain games, but carry out instruction to the absolute letter of law. I think that's been incredible. I'll, I'll cite maybe Celtic Park and then um, the, the, the first European game as well as being prime examples of how well 
tactically this side is drilled and set up. And that, to me, dude, could be more impressive than, than going beating Hamilton 8 0 because it's, it's easy to be attacking and open and free flowing and, and pick teams apart. Um, or it should be in, in terms of the quality we have, but it's even more in- incredible, I think, to to set them up um, to, for a game plan and to be patient and trusting enough in, in all your teammates and carry that out exactly to the letter, um, like we did, especially at Celtic Park with the wing-backs when they, the full-backs when they held in, and, and we just waited and we picked off and we took our chances and we then went ahead in these games and they're quite comfortable to do their jobs and defend and sit knowing full well that they're going to see out the game and I think that's a, a maturity um, and I'm, I'm going to yep CJ here it comes <laughs> the evolution of this side again oh. is just growing and growing and getting better and more mature as we go along I like CJ, it. <laughs> CJ if there are if there are players that I do think right now we he is an absolute must regardless of you know, form or whatever. Uh, there are three I would pick out. Um, two in the defence, although one we can hardly call a defender, uh, and one attacker, uh, and that's of course James Tavernier, yep. Connor Goldson, and Ryan Kent. Mm-hmm. Because I think that they do things for the side on top of being good players. And you know, the likes of Balogun and Ellen, there are excellent defenders. I'm quite happy with them. But Goldson leads that defence. Tavernier leads the side. You can see it. It's not just about his goals and his attack play, but he is the guy, his relentlessness, he, he leads by example. And Ken, because he's the type of guy that even if he's having, you know, not, not his best day, he's yeah. still capable, he still goes looking for the ball. Uh, and I think that he gives the rest of the attack inside a bit of confidence because they know that if we can just stick in this and get the ball to him, he'll do something. What are your thoughts? Are there anyone else you would add to that list or, or any of the three of them you would take out? But it's really hard hard to argue with them. I'd almost say they were the staples of the squad so far this season, uh, especially Tavernier. Because he played 20 games, 12 goals, 9 assists. He's a right back. That's terrifying. <laughs> like that, that's, like that, that's a joke. That, that's, that's, that's FIFA numbers. You know what I mean? You'd be happy with that halfway through your actual career mode if you were playing that. Uh, and but this is what he's doing on a consistent level now. And you said Connor Golds now, and I think when no fans been there, us being able to hear more of the shouts and the screams and the yells, I think we're really starting to understand just how really vocal Golds is. Because we heard the likes of Halliday all say it when they talked up when he left. Uh, when he left the club, he talked up Golds, and we've heard that before about how vocal Golds was. But I think now that we can actually hear them shouting and or almost organising the defence, you can see how important he actually is. And He's been outstanding. I think the fact that we've got two goalkeepers sitting with eight uh, clean sheets each is probably a big, massive thing and an indication of just how well run this team actually is right now. But literally, it goes all the way through the squad. You've got Ryan Jack now coming back looking undroppable, but you've got Kamara looking undroppable. You've got <laughs> you've got Arfield looking undroppable. It's, 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 it's a very good thing to be a Rangers fan because everyone right now is stepping up to the plate and going and getting it when they get a chance. Tommy, it's built on that isn't it that that clean sheet record and it's almost been a bit ridiculous that Rangers have achieved this so much and it's clearly something you know they talk about it a lot you hear the the, the defenders talking about it a lot that it that matters to them and I think it's quite apparent that it matters to Alan McGregor but it's an incredible I mean it, it was pretty special when we started this show a month ago but for it to have continued the way it has and it's not just been in terms of goals conceded, it's been in terms of shots conceded. Teams just find it very difficult to play against us. The defence has obviously been exceptional, but that does come from the front. You know, that, that, that comes from not allowing teams to play through you. Uh, and again, it's, it's, I think, testament to the fact that this side plays as a unit. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's a very, very solid take on that. You know, and I'm... I think, much like every other Rangers fan, very, very pleased with this, I'll say iteration instead of evolution, just to be different, <laughs> um, this uh, this iteration of Stephen Gerrard's Rangers. And you're right, it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier as well, of, you know, there's a comfort in the players that are on the pitch or who are, who are uh, on the bench or coming on, everybody knows their job, and all of that gets to the, to the, the fact that every player knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing and to be in to cover for other players as well. I, I think the key part that you pick out there the story inside the story of that uh, clean sheet record run is the fact that there's so little shots on goal and we've played some really good teams. This is the fact that, you know, Rangers by and large are choking the life out of teams 
further up the pitch. We're not getting particularly exposed, and when you consider how we actually set up most of the time with our really attacking fullbacks, it's really unheard of to not be exploited to some extent. But you know, the only team that managed to to really do that to any large degree being Benfica, and you would expect them to make some sort of chances. But yeah, I mean, it's starting to become, you know, it is a bit ridiculous in that. Um, I think you know, if it's McLaughlin this end or it's McGregor, they they should be working on their memoir. Uh, whilst they're sitting there because they're not doing much else. That said, to make a, a less flippant point, you also do hear the talking between the goalkeeper, between the back four, between the midfield when they're dropping slightly deep to c- create the box in front of, let's say, a Golden or a Hellander or a Balogun. But again, you're looking through the squad, just to broaden out your question slightly, and you're looking at the players who would come in. So if Hellander has a, let's say, his version of Goldson and, and Spartak, um, against Benfica, you've got a Balogun who can come back in there as well. If Bonner goes out, you've got a Bassi who, more importantly than the forward element, actually knows how to defend. You've got Tav playing you know, the best he's ever played. It is a ridiculous challenge for teams, not just in Scotland, but in uh, Europe, to say, OK, we're coming up against not only a team high in confidence, but a really well-drilled and well-strategised um, team that know their positions, and we have to try and break them down. And Rangers aren't there to make up the numbers in these games. They're there to get goals and implement their style of play on all teams, which seems to be working as well. It's, you know, woe betide anybody coming up against us right now. I think there's a, a flush of confidence, but more importantly, a flush of understanding and knowing through the team, which is why we're dominating so much. Right, let's go back then and look at, you know, the matches. Four league matches took place, uh, three European matches. And... Fun thing to look back on as an old firm win at Park Of course, they're becoming fairly routine at the moment. Uh, you know, it just seems to be the way of things this year. But Stevie, the best thing about this match was uh, all of us. You know, you and I talk every day, and 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 we were confident, and we were worried about how confident we were because we were like, no, we're, we're going to win. We're going to go there. And I think we're going to win, and we're going to win. You know, probably quite straightforwardly. And we went there, and we won quite straightforwardly. Yeah, we certainly did. Uh, we were as comfortable there or in an old for match that I can remember. Um, as comfortable as I think we've, we've ever been, certainly, in my time. But even with five minutes left, David, I was still panicking. We're too deep, we're too this, we're too that. And in reality, you know, watching it back, as, as I tend to do, uh, we were very, very comfortable. They obviously didn't have any shots on target or anything. But... Um, that just kind of it sums up how well drilled we were. And aside of one um, slight defensive mishap, which is the only issue I have with with the defence, is sometimes I think we get caught square with a through ball. Now that through ball that Griffiths went on to that day was the exact one that caught us in Benfica, and I do think that that's a, a slight issue that sometimes we we get caught on that we need to watch, but. Aside of that, it was an extremely straightforward performance. I thought Goldson was excellent, and it was nice to see him get, um, you know, some of the headlines and praise because I think that he's one that's kind of taken his game up, up a level. Um, the likes of James Tavernier and, and and others have done that, but Goldson's certainly been one. So it was nice to get for him to have his moment. Yeah, I was delighted to see that as well, CJ. But it was the manner in which Rangers did it that we turned up with a plan, executed it superbly. Um, I think everybody won their individual battles. And then, you know, understandably, at 2-0, Rangers then said, OK, we've done our bit. We've got a big game on Thursday night. We can kick <laughs> off our Europa League. No, genuinely, you know, we've got... Yeah. So we've done the hard work. We're 2-0 up, and we don't think you can hurt us. And they were right. I, that, that's just the confidence they've gone into these games. Now, I think the, the fear factor and the mentally scarred Rangers teams of the past going into these games versus Celtic are long, long gone and almost forgotten. Uh, maybe a wee reminder going into the game, something to put up in the dressing room, but at the same time, as these are a different set of players under Gerrard. They've matured now, as we mentioned earlier on the podcast, and they've gone into these games and not one of them lost a battle again. 11 for 11, they won their individual battles and everyone ran their heart. Even Barker, who obviously came on, he was... He was a bit of a question going into the game, but he still stuck to his task. Maybe not as much going forward, but defensively, he was backing up his fullback and just really shutting down uh, the lads. I can't remember his name for AC Milan for, for them, but 
I was just really impressed with just how we're going out and setting these games and the aggressive way that we're setting the tone right away with the first challenge. I think, I think the first foul in the game was Barker on Scott Brown. Yes. <laughs> and, I just, <laughs> and I like that. I like that. We're going out there, just it's like the times before, going out there, setting the tone and then just saying, right, we're going to bully you. And we did. Yeah, I, I think that's a key point, Tommy, that the fear factor, which has not been there for teams against us, understandably, is returning. Um, you know, you, Hamilton, you could see five minutes into that game <laughs> were desperate to get off the pitch because they knew what was likely to happen to them. And it's the fact that it then does happen to them that helps. But the converse of that is that by removing that sheen a little bit from Celtic, by showing the rest of the league, I mean, Aberdeen got a point against them for Christ's sake. That's epoch defining stuff. Um, and I think that for me, that, that our success against them. And the way that we're doing it, it's not by nicking a point, it's not defensive, it's not a keeper having a great game, it was by showing up at their ground, dubbing them, looking like the much more confident and assured side. And I also like the celebrations at the end of that, the, right, OK, business, job done, couple of high fives after pitch, big game on Thursday. I think that all of that helps in terms of feeding an impression of, oh, wait a minute, this Rangers team is, is seriously heavy duty. And also the converse of that is, whereas we can get at a Celtic team, yeah, I mean, just when you thought 2020 couldn't get any wilder, Aberdeen go and take a point. Uh, yeah. Over Celtic and no doubt bust everybody's curtains, uh, I would imagine. Uh, but, but you're right in terms of it's you know, Emperor's New Clothes or Feet of Clay or whatever way you want, it, you want to see it. By showing Celtic can be routinely dominated, then you're hoping other teams in Scotland take take note of that and, and try and try and get after them. Because I think they've had a relatively easy ride last couple of, couple of years. Um, the Hamilton game was a really good example of us saying no we're we're going to go after you as well and you're absolutely right in terms of i think five ten minutes in those boys were, were you know thinking about pulling up with hamstring injuries and signaling mm-hmm. to the bench uh they did not want to be there uh, other than for maybe some selfies um and they wanted to get away going back to the the old firm game i think one of the key points there is not only did we did we boss it and you know, I don't take any of the the comments that were there about a weakened you know, Celtic team or anything like that. You know, maybe Odson Edward, notwithstanding, because he is actually a reasonably good player. Um, but I think it was the the manner, and CJ touched on this as well. For me, it's the way that Rangers are turning up to these games. And a small shout out to the mentality of James Tavernier, who's had a lot of that scar tissue, and I'm delighted to be seeing some of the some of the goods the good times now. But it's the manner we rocked up, which is not only do we know we can beat you and we fully intend to. But we're going to set the parameters of what you're allowed to do on your own pitch. And that's the big difference for me because Rangers were, by and large, never in trouble. Maybe that through ball from uh, that, uh, that Griffiths got on to, um, notwithstanding. But they were pretty much put in a sandbox of, we'll allow you to have the ball. And I think some of the stats in terms of possession bore that out. Celtic had 50 odd percent or whatever, Rangers less, obviously. Um, but Rangers were just comfortable. Yeah, you do that. We'll score a couple of goals. By and large, not break sweat. Show you how to get bossed in your own place. And yeah, we'll move on to bigger and better things. It was that ability. And that's not to you know uh, denigrate or discount the amount of work that goes into that on the training ground and on the pitch. But I think that was the big key difference. It didn't seem like a hassle with Rangers, that everything was in place. They knew their jobs. They knew the parameters that they would set for Celtic. And Celtic couldn't do anything about that. That's the real sea change for me. So we are trying, but they just couldn't do anything about what Rangers were doing to them. No, I'd agree with that. And I think that it is, it's is—it's not simply about the victory. It was the manner of the victory. Mm. And you can see the effect that it had in Celtic. They haven't recovered yet. The, the, the fact is that they've then sort of stumbled across the rest of the month because it was such a savage blow to their, to their confidence. But it was important Rangers didn't let up on that, Stevie. We had Livingston the next week. Not the most glamorous fixture in the league you'll ever get, but the manager was able to make changes. Rangers were two up by half time, job done. But I want to move on to the match after it because to me and to you and to, to the, the the boys on the show, and I'm sure to other listeners, this felt like a litmus test. This was a match that we were all looking at weeks in advance and saying we will find out about this Rangers side that day because of the way that we've struggled and we have badly, badly struggled at rugby partners. No getting away from it. Some awful performances down there. Kilmarnock have made life far too hard for us for what they have. But we knew we were going down, shit pitch, 
Kilmarnock side that's bang up for it. I think the manager had, you know, pointed out that some of them, uh, I think we can crack his code when he said that they might not be Rangers fans. Um, <laughs> and we we knew, uh, speaking to Bears, I was the same, you know, looking ahead to this and going, you know, this is all well and good, but that's the big test because we've struggled so badly. And and for me, the, the most gratifying thing about that one was Kelly didn't play badly. Rangers weren't at our fluent best. It's hard to be on that part, but still. But we got the job done. We did what we needed to do. We got out of dodge with three points. And I think that the impact on both players and supporters of that result, OK, yeah, it's only Kilmarnock, but even so, that felt like a really significant victory. said to you before it, and I said that after on, online, that um, I didn't care how we did it that day. Um, I don't think when you go to a place like Rugby Park, maybe similarly when you go to Livingston, um, these pitches are horrendous. It's all about three points. I don't care how they perform. I don't care how they do it. I don't care how they manage it. Um, three points up the road. Nobody injured um, because we know that pitch basically cost Jamie Murphy his Rangers career. Yeah. Um, and and subsequently, I don't think Jamie Murphy has recovered from that injury. I don't think he looks anywhere. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so when these games come around, David, I'm not interested in a, a, a free flowing. You know, three, four goals, whatever. I just want three points. And that day they ground it out. And sometimes when you're going for um, titles and when you're trying to be successful and everything else, that these are the games that mentally you have to get over. Because if we're all thinking like that, there's absolutely no doubt that the players are also thinking like that as well, oh. saying to themselves, well, this is a challenge, you know, th- there will be some kind of mental scarring there as well. I would dare say that that game was probably harder for them as a collective group than it would have been, you know, going to Celtic Park. Um, because Kilmarnock, you know, sit in, ground, ground out kind of possession. And, oh, yeah. And, and just, watch. Oh, I, and it's just the, the long ball up all the time. And it's, it's very difficult. Um, but we, you know, we obviously, we managed to get the three points up the road. And it, and it was... It, it seems silly to say it, but it was a very huge victory for us in terms of mentality and and the kind of character and growth of the club to or or the players rather or the squad to say that right we managed that's another hurdle we can we can tick off and and now keep powering on. Yeah, CJ, uh, Stevie touched on a point there that I think is important that these small tests, right? And nobody's kidding ourselves on about you know Kilmarnock or whatever, but, but it's it's a test. And there is no magic bullet to get to be in a championship winning side. There is no one thing. You can't swing for the fences. Uh, you see it, right? If you want an example right now in England, it's Manchester United, isn't it? Oh, we'll make this sign and then everything will be all right. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> no. You have to build and you've got to... You, you can't just go out and spend X amount of money on a player and you can't just say, oh, well, we'll change to this system. It's about these small tests and ticking them off because it builds in the squad. Yeah, or, you know, look, well, we had to do that, and we did, and we had to do that, and we did. So going to Parkhead, handling them the way he did, no problem. Following it up, done, no problem. Kilmarnock, done, no problem. All of these things add up. Oh, absolutely, mate, and that's what you that's what you need. Um, you kind of get the old mentality of one game at a time, and as long as you keep winning your league games, you know what's going to be coming at the end of the season. But I like the focus that jerry has got. Whenever he's asked in the press conference and stuff like that about the future and all, oh, how do you feel about this position, he always brings it back to the next game. And I truly believe that's in the players' uh, minds. They look at every game as a cup final. Tavernier said that, the, I think it was last week um, or the week before. Every game is a cup final for these players, and that's the mentality that they're having there to win these battles. And I can re- I, everyone just kind of touched on it there about the Kilmarnock game, but that was huge for me. I was... So nervous that entire game. Know that the fact that I think that Kamar can hurt us, but just with everything that's happened in the past, then you know what I mean. Even with a late corner or that, if they were getting, I was like, oh no, but we were just defending so, so well. <laughs> <laughs> See, when they, every time they got a corner, I went off. Oh, oh, here oh, we go. Here we go. go. That's oh. it. That's the scaring. Uh, that's it's scaring. Uh, but I was just so proud of the way we defended and we got the job. Tavernier stepped up for the spot in that game as well. But I, it's, it's just. The, 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 the mentality of this Rangers team seems to be you now they aren't going in worried about what's to come. There's no got any pressure on them. They're looking at the next 90 minutes. Let's win that. Let's win our indiv- individual battles per game and the results will follow. And so far this season, that's exactly what's happened. Every game. 
Building blocks, yeah, totally. Um, I think you're spot on there. It's it's about just building up this platform that we can yeah. achieve success from. And then, of course, you know, we wrapped it up with that victory against Hamilton. Some wonderful <laughs> football being played, Tommy. And also the introduction of a, a new player, Bongani Zungu, come into the side. And that game, to me, it was very interesting because before it, I was sitting looking at, you know, what team would I pick? And genuinely did struggle a little bit because I, I, I picked my midfield and I went, oh, actually, no, I've left it him and that's not fair and I should put in, I, I, I can't fit them all in. And it'd been a long time since I'd, I'd felt that way. Yeah, there's a really good, uh, I think it's one of the themes that's running through this podcast, isn't it? We've spoken several times about the, the ability to turn to the bench. And, and know what's there. Just, just for to answer that, just go back to that Kelly uh, point for a second as well. I think one of the deep frustrations that certainly I'd felt, I don't know about other fans as well, was that we had fallen into Kelly's trap so many times in that yeah, they, they, weren't doing anything, they weren't doing anything surprising to us, but we continued to fall for it. And by and large, we didn't play amazing that day either. But once my, uh, once my heartbeat had stopped uh, doing a kind of techno um, uh, tribute and it got back mm-hmm. down, I was quite glad of the way that it kind of panned out. We didn't play particularly well. Terrible conditions, tons of pressure in the last, you know, five, ten minutes. And we saw it out. That kind of momentum is, you know, really, really important. And that brings us back on to the Hamilton thing. Yeah, I mean, Zungu looked extremely, extremely impressive. Got a goal for South Africa the other night as well. So I think Zungu's uh, passing was uh, was obviously great to see. We're over uh, the top for Ryan Kenny, etc. Doesn't do it justice. But you're absolutely right uh, in terms of you're looking through the squad and you're thinking there's a really, really strong ability to, to change the team to freshen up, again, without any uh, drop in ability and or drop in desire. And that's probably something we've not quite touched up on in that these guys are getting a chance for a jersey now and coming off the bench and desperate to show what they can do. Some of the, the latter stages of the Hamilton game definitely showed that. I, you know, slight, slight feeling for the Hamilton guys because they were getting battered from, from pillar to post. But as a kind of final capstone to that as well, it shows you with the right level of analysis behind the scenes. Uh, and I know this wasn't your question because you were concentrating on Zungu, but with the right level of analysis, the right clear plan, you don't have to spend millions and millions to catch teams and overhaul them and build something that's really impressive on the park. And that's probably one of the, the greatest high points of um, Stephen Gerrard's reign so far. Um, and that he's been able to put together a team of not a lot of cost basis, which is really, really performing to high standard. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a money ball element to, to Rangers' business that I think players mm-hmm. are signed oh. for their ability to do specific things. Yeah. Um, again, what you need. And again, you know, I always look down south, for examples, because it's so close to us. And, and yeah, it's a different financial level. But if you look at what Liverpool did, they built over four or five windows. And I think as fans, we've got this tendency to think, right, well, over four windows, you get some players you need the first one, some players you need the second, et cetera. But it doesn't work like that. It's sometimes you get a player for the long term and somebody who'll do a job temporarily. And then, you know, they need to... And sometimes players don't work. So there's a little bit of trial and error and it takes a wee while. But I can see us getting there. The fusion seems seems about right at the moment. Stevie, let's move then on to, to Europe, which... It's the most bizarre thing because all of us, I think, at the start of the season said, ah, well, Europe, you know, it's a bonus this year. It'd be good to get there to get the finances, but, you know, domestic takes priority. And, of course, we, we got through the qualifiers very straightforwardly, some excellent performances, Willem and, and Galatasaray. And then into the group stage, off we go to Belgium. Um, they decided they would spice it up a little bit, the Belgians, by getting us to play underwater, which which was novel. Um, under you're a ref, Stevie. Uh, that people might not know. This. Stevie's a professionally qualified referee. He, he, he does referee. Uh, uh, if that had been a normal game that wasn't on the telly, wasn't in the middle of a season where it wasn't Europe, so it's very difficult to replay anyway, and wasn't in the middle of this. There are no gaps. Covid season. Um, tell me that pit, pitch was unplayable in the last half hour, wasn't it? Yeah, I think if it had, <laughs> if it been... yeah. If it had been in that condition um, before, you know, like maybe 30 minutes in, I think the game would have been called. Oh, but you get to a point in, in a game where you, you are mentality and mindset is, well, we're, we're out now, so we're finishing this. And I think, I guarantee you there was a wee guy for UEFA at the side going, just you get fucking done with us. Aye, <laughs> I, I basically, you know. <laughs> um, but, 
I think that's what what made it um, just as impressive for us. I mean, we adapted again, um, and we looked comfortable. They didn't, um, you know, and there was that that led to the old internet cries of you know Sevco even even get you know, the rain <laughs> for us. So, <laughs> the always I always kind of rounded off by. You know, a, a, a tap in by Kamar Roof. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I which, do better. which I, I mean, I would agree with Stephen Gerrard is is, is possibly the, the best goal I've I've seen for Rangers in terms of quality. And and I said to you, David, I'd taken the kids down to to Sandrum Castle in the caravan, and um, and, and me and the, and the missus were were watching that basically on on our phone because we didn't have any other way of watching it. And when that goal went in, the old caravan was rocking mm-hmm. back in the old Andy Gorham days. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was unexpected. You know, it, it was one of those ones though, when he was doing it and you thought, right, you know, just keep take it to the corner. And yeah. when he hit it, I immediately said out loud, oh, that looks good. Because it just looked, the yeah. trajectory of, of it and everything else, as soon as he hit it, I thought that that's going to, that's there and thereabouts. I didn't expect it to go in because it basically dropped in the net, like past the line. And the accuracy of it and everything was incredible. And I'll be amazed if that goal. And I know a boy scored a kind of free kick uh, the following week, but I don't illegal think that, free kick. An illegal free kick. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think that you know Roof took on three, four players exactly, and, and then had the the skill and ability to to do that as well was just. An incredible moment, but overall, again that night, I, I just thought we were so resolute. I thought we were so organised. It really was a Michael Beale masterclass in terms of how we were set up and how we were drilled. And and again, Calvin Bassey came in that night for Borna. He was tremendous again. Um, you know the centre halves, everything about it, just excellent. And you can't fault them. It wasn't. It wasn't again. It wasn't like um, you know a flashy performance in terms of Hamilton. It was a well drilled, uh, well set up, resolute performance, and they got exactly what they set out to get. Um, capped off by a moment of, of just sheer brilliance. We then went on to Lech Poznan at home, Lech a good side, but this to me was quite a telling match, CJ, in terms of where we are uh, in Europe and our reputation being enhanced over the last few years that they completely changed the way they play when they came to play Rangers. They don't play like that normally, but they adjusted their tactics to try and stop us. Uh, and for large parts, to be fair to them, it worked. The, the, the two teams that were you know, both good on the ball, both technical, but kind of cancelled each other out because they had changed their normal play. So they didn't have quite the attacking threat they normally have because they were concentrating on stopping us. And it felt like a game that one goal would win and, and when Rangers got it, it was an absolute... Peach, uh, just a, a ball so beautiful from Borna that I oh, want to put lipstick yeah. on it and date it. And then Alfie with, if you want a dictionary definition, thumping header. It That's was it. that one. But to me, the, the the you know the the, the interesting thing at that match was I was like, oh, here's a team now that are actually coming and saying, and this this has not happened to a Rangers side for a long time at this level in Europe. We need to change what we do because if we play them at, at their normal way, they will gub us. And I thought that it was an interesting sign of respect from from Lech Poznan and maybe quite a telling thing about where Rangers are considered you know, out with Scotland. I, I think you've, you've nailed it when you say the respect because that's definitely what they got coming into this game. And like you said, they, are, they didn't normally adjust it. We talked about that in the preview. They normally have one set way of playing, but they turned up at Ibrox and it was different. They were I actually had people tracking back in the wing back positions. They were trying to double up on their full backs. And <laughs> that just normally doesn't happen. They normally always just go on forward and it was actually pretty I suppose if you want to say it was a pretty back and forth type of game but still that's another game of football even though they had 10 shots they didn't get a shot on target that's how well Rangers still defended but in terms of reputation in Europe I think it was the Benfica manager that says that that we're pretty much um, it's going to be us and them going through in the group and that's kind of him talking up how good this Rangers side actually is and we've had obviously managers and uh, European knockouts say that we were a Champions League side so I think there is definitely a change people aren't looking at Rangers saying oh that's an easy game now they're looking at Rangers especially at Ibrox saying right we need to adjust their tactics or they'll just beat us at our own game because that's what we do at Ibrox, uh, Ibrox sorry, especially in Europe we take whatever 
they normally bring in, we normally sit in and then counter that and hit them on the, the break. And I, I just love the fact that, yes, it was only 1-0. It wasn't like a, like a smash nor anything like that. But that game right there was, was just so impressive as a fan because you got to see a, a European side, a good European side, by the yeah. way, actually come to Ibrox and go, right, we need to change. Yeah, and for me, that, that, that signalled a, a bit of a change. We then go to Benfica. I don't think, Tommy, that a lot of us were you know, too overly expecting. They're, they are a Champions League side. They have spent oh. Champions League money. They are a very good side. And for the first 15 minutes, uh, I thought, oh, because they played us off the frigging park, right? Not, not, not one Rangers fan, I think, would... Would deny that we we you know concede a stupid early goal. The normally ever so reliable Phil Elder, who has a, just a complete Melton. nightmare, Aye, just yeah. a terrible night. But we get back in. You know the great long ball over the top. Ryan Kent um, gets hauled down. They go down to ten men, and then for an hour, Rangers proceed to turn into Real Madrid circa nineteen sixty. It was <laughs> astonishing. Rangers battered them. Now look, yeah, ten men. Absolutely, right, get it, no problem, 10 men, it's a factor, you can't deny that it's a factor, but you still have to then go and do it, and you still, and I don't think we would collapse against a side going, even going to 10 men, uh, Villarreal a couple of years ago speaks of it, Rangers were just immense for an hour, and then contrive in the last quarter of an hour to oh. completely shoot ourselves in the foot, it was a wild, wild game of football. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, you just reminded me of all the different component parts of it. To be honest, you know, breaking out in a cold sweat. But yeah, yeah I mean, I'll, I'll be you know quite honest. Before the match, I, I didn't think we would get anything from it. I thought Benfica at home would be uh, by far and away the toughest test of the group, and they are a really, really, really good side. Uh, and they'd obviously had taken like Poznan apart uh, in Poland as well. But then, as you say, you know. You, you get the sending off. I think it was uh, it was Otamendi, wasn't it? Uh, pulling back, pulling back Ken on the run through, um, and you think, hold on, okay, we're one 0 down, but this changes the complexion. And, and we all know as well as you said there that really good, well drilled teams don't fall apart. Ten men, they know their shape. We've got it as well. They get back inside, they they get really close, and they they can generally manage a game. Um, it's not the old style where you know everybody's chasing the ball and there's massive gaps or anything like that. I think the frustrating thing was we did play extremely, extremely well to take advantage of those gaps. We pulled Benfica apart in several places, playing through them, getting over the top, getting in behind, all that type of thing. And they were genuinely struggling with us for a large part of that game. The real frustration for me was, I, I would take the OG at the start to one side, right? But the Silva goal, and I think it's Nunez, who looked like a player, uh, who scores the, the last one in the dying seconds, is that it's us that's cost it. You know, these aren't worldies, for want of a better way of putting it. Um, not a phrase that I managed to dredge up that often, to be honest with you. But, you know, we just shot ourselves in the foot. As I said earlier, Holander's had his, his version of Goldstone and Spartak tonight, where he's often an extremely good reader of the game and gets himself his body shape into really good positions. He has a bit of a nightmare, particularly with the, the second one, the silver one. Um, a couple of attempts at it and doesn't manage to get it out from under his feet uh, and then we let them back in and then we had a couple of chances which we didn't take and then ultimately you get to that last you know two minutes and you're thinking hold on to the ball you know this isn't Liege nobody needs to score a, a worldie you know um, or anything like that you know Arfield tries to play a through ball and I'm not blaming the individual player but then there's like fantastic you know, pass uh, through, and I think CJ had said earlier on that he sometimes fears that we're open to the to the you know when we get square on and balls through it. Was, well, that was a case in point there because the two centre backs aren't close enough. Uh, Helen Dunn and Goldson the ball goes right through. It's a lovely finish, but it shouldn't have happened. And when you get to that point, you're thinking, oh wow, well, we're about to take three points here, six out of six, having went to Benfica. You'd have ripped people's hands off for that before the game, but with the way it played out, yeah, you walk away with a little bit of a bitter taste in the uh, in the mouth. That said, if that's our only gripe over the past seven games, do you know what? That's not a bad place to be and you might just very well be in amongst the trophies come the end of the season. So, aye, it's, it's one of those ones that, a bit of a scratch of the head moment, it's not often we perform that badly at the back. It wouldn't be Rangers if we didn't have won things. <laughs> <laughs> 
Give it to Stevie. <laughs> he's choking. <laughs> he's choking on her. He's, he's, he's not only had to be uh, cheery for two episodes in a row completely, but uh, so much so that it, it, it made him ill uh, having, to hold, <laughs> having to hold this in. So, but COVID will affect every team. We accept that. Everybody has to accept it, especially with the farce of international friendlies being played. Oh which is, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about last month, but a disgrace. But every team will have to live with the effects of COVID, as the world has to live with the effects of COVID. But Stevie, one thing that I think we can ask of our players not to do is if they come back from international duty and they have COVID, that happens. If they are playing a match and an opponent has it unknown to anyone and they get it, that happens. If they turn up at a party on a Sunday night, uh, and then, as far as I can see, we are prepared to, had they not been caught, waltz into training on the Tuesday without cracking a light, then I think we've got a right to be angry with them. And I'm talking, of course, about uh, the COVID idiots, uh, Jordan Jones and George Edmondson. Your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are that both should never play for the club again. Um, sorry if that's harsh and... And people will disagree. I didn't really have much to say about it at the time because you can be reactive and I'm trying not to be reactive um, or overreactive to, to certain situations. But my anger um, over their selfishness hasn't changed. Had they have, you know, went into training and, and done all that, then I don't think there's any way that the government wouldn't have taken the opportunity to have another swipe at, at football. Oh, yeah, uh, through the book at them. Yeah, not necessarily Rangers. I'm not going to go down the route of, of because it's us, they would have jumped on us. I, I think it's because it's it's football and, yep. and they've already spoken out. They would have been forced to again. Um, but what worries me more is that we're in such a good place that these people would, these players would put their season in jeopardy to do that. Um, I think is unforgivable. There's been issues with Jordan Jones before um, with other players and incidents that he's had and it's not worth really kind of going into, but I think he's definitely burned his bridges. But I'm more disappointed than George Edmondson and I know George Edmondson's young and um, he's he's just a young lad and everything else, but he had a real opportunity to, to kick on in terms of where he was last season and how he finished and as, as, as effectively first choice before the, the, the lockdown happened. He had a real opportunity to kick on and he hasn't done it. And and people are going to moan about what I'm about to say. Um, oh, but, yeah, right. Go on, go on. <laughs> right on this. That, see, that, that's always a good sign. Right. See, when you see stuff online from the likes of Lana Wolf and all this nonsense, right, talking about George Edmondson and everything else, and I get it, I'm, I'm 37, I'm an old guy and it, it doesn't bother me and everything else, but... See, when you then see George Edmondson following her and, and there's a wee bit of interaction between them and all that, I'm not interested in that. I don't want my players behaving like that. If you're going to do that, do it when it's not in the public eye. I'm not interested. And when that happens and then he goes and buggers off to a party where it's, it's girls that have got like only fans and, and everything else and he's posing for photos and this and that, I'm not interested in that, David. This is too important a season for us. And we're too big a club to have wee guys being wee guys. I don't have time for it at all. If you want to behave like that, then, then fine. Look, you're a young lad. That's no problem. You just don't do it here. Neither of them, in my opinion, should play for the club again. Um, I think George Edmondson, Edmondson has a slight chance in terms of he's not got the history that Jordan Jones has. But this is where I want to slightly twist it and praise somebody else because in the summer, Brandon Barker was basically told you know, the same as Jones, you've got to grab your opportunity now and, and take your opportunity. Now, Brandon Barker, in my opinion, has knuckled down. He started to show effectiveness in, in certain games. He, he's scored a few goals. And I don't think he'll ever be a first-team regular starter, as in, like, here's my living, I would put Brandon Barker in. But what he is capable of doing is being a 16-18 to 18 player in terms of squad-wise that will bring maybe 7 to 10 goals. And these are the guys that win championships. So when you've got one guy like him prepared to knuckle down, take his opportunity, work his bollocks off in training by all accounts, 
and then you've got another who's prepared to just throw it away. I know who I would rather stick with. And I know that people are going to listen to this and think, oh, you know, this is his opportunity to be grumpy and all that, then fine. But um, I just, I, they could have ruined absolutely everything that we've built so far. And that, for me, is unforgivable. Stevie had uh, mentioned something there that really struck a chord with me, CJ, and that's that at first when it happened, my natural thing with players is you know, you, you, you have your initial angry reaction and then I try to calm down a bit yeah. and look at it a, 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 with a wee bit of distance and, and I, I do have, have sympathy for, for young guys who are uh, make bad decisions because I was a young guy who made bad decisions so I get it and, and you know the, somebody said to me at that age yeah we've got a party where well, there's you know loads of attractive ladies of shall we say um I don't know how to say this politely. Um, the type of girl who's prepared to get her rat out on the internet for money, <laughs> then I would have thought... That, of all the ways you know, that I thought you were going to approach that there, David, nope. that's not the way... I am not no. judging them. I'm sure they are very, very nice young lazy. I'm not a hypocrite. I have, um, uh, you know, utilised the service of naked ladies in magazines. I'm so old, never mind the interwebs. So... <laughs> This is becoming um, a totally different podcast. To I like this, but this is a you, podcast. I like you brought it. up porn stars. You brought <laughs> up porn stars. Uh, although uh, I, I said that about the young lady you referred to as like she's a porn star, and a guy I know who has far more interest in that sort of uh, oeuvre than me said, oh, she's not a star. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, no, she's, she's a star, but, but uh, uh, actress then. But, yeah, no, like, I get it, right? There's loads of balls. Do you want to go to a party? Yeah, I'm fed up with this lockdown. Maybe frustrated I'm not getting a game. So I, I wasn't at first. You know, I was like, I, OK. But then I found my anger wasn't going away, CJ. And the reason for it was you would have gone to training. Yeah. You oh, would have risked everything we've been building for the last few weeks. And that was when I went. I, there's self-harming yourself through your behaviour. And that is one thing. Um, but then there's, you were prepared to damage the rest of your teammates' hard work and their sacrifice of living in the bubble and, and following the procedures. And through no fault of their own, because you couldn't do it, you were prepared to do that. And that's the bit that I struggled with because I, I, I don't feel my anger particularly receding, even with time, over that. No, it's, it's one of the things that the mayor you actually think about it, the mayor annoyed you actually go, because as you've said, and as Stevie says, um, they would have went into training, and then if that had came out, just say they had been training for a couple of days, then the story came out, and everything like that, um, it would have still affected the squad, because we'd had to have done this, and this, and this, and then who knows, going into the next game, what squad we could have even been able to put on the actual park, and I just think it's unbelievably selfish, and I think about it from this way as well, is we're annoyed as fans, can you imagine being in that dressing room, running mm. your heart and soul and fucking putting that amount of effort in, Dane Everhan, putting yourself in this position, taking all the knocks, playing hot, playing injured, coming back, and then you've got two guys kind of in the outskirts willing to put all that at risk for a diddy wee party on a mm. Sunday night. Uh, and when Gerard's actually gave people time off because of how much hard work they've actually put in, I just think it's, I honestly agree with Stevie, as harsh as it is, um, I, I just don't see them playing again. George Edmondson, you could maybe make a case like you said, that his young laddie, we've all made mistakes trust me, I've, I've made many but it's just one of the aliens that I just didn't think how you could go to that locker room after that and just explain to them that you were willing to do that and put all their hard work and that's where I think the issue is really going to come from. As fans uh, just say George Jones comes on the last minute, speaks 10 players and scores on 90th minute winner, there'd probably be a wee bit of forgiveness there but I just think as, as players on that park you would look at that and just be like I can't believe he's willing to risk that for a stupid wee party. Yeah, that's that's it. exactly, and and I know how I'd feel if I was in that dressing room. Tommy, can I just I, I, oh, sorry, sorry? Can I can I just say as well the fact that I've actually heard Stevie say only fans, Lana Wolf, and I've heard you say uh, right out on the internet. That's sort of saved 2020 for me. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I'm sitting here pretending that I don't I, I don't know who Lana Wolf or any of this type of OnlyFans stuff is, so I would just like to go out there in case anybody I know listens to this. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it kind of annoys me that I know all of this, but, you know, it's uh, 
Because, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't really know that, you know, the war's finished, to be honest. And then, uh, it, but this thing has entered my consciousness, which I think uh, says says a lot. But, you know, Tommy, are we being a little harsh? Is it a case of just saying, that, that you know, the, the daft boyness Scottish excuse got played a bit? And my take on that is Jordan Jones is, what, 26, 27? How... Uh, how long do you get to be a daft boy? When? How many scrapes do you get in before people say, "No, that's not naivety. That's you." Yeah, we're definitely not being too harsh. Uh, so you know, calls tied round the mast and firmly stapled on. The two of them are done, uh, and they quite rightly should be. And they should, you know, get to the rocking chair age and look back and say, "We had a great opportunity, a massive, massive institutional club." And we absolutely blew it because we fancied, you know, partying with some girls. It would be, and Jordan Jones, we've, we've spoken about this, Jordan Jones had baggage. He was given a chance to get to, to Rangers and perform. By and large, he's never taken it anyway. And George Edmondson's the disappointment one because he seems like a keen young lad and he's a pretty decent defender and there was a, a space for him, particularly when you look at injuries to people like Nikola Katic. But... And if you wanted to rehabilitate either of them, it would be it would be George Edmondson. But I, I once I get the argument uh, or the counter argument of young lads, youngish lads, because you're right with the Jordan Jones element, youngish lads who it's difficult circumstances, global pandemic, etc. They've made a, a bit of a uh, a mistake. Although that doesn't get them out the fact that if they wouldn't have been caught, they they would have just sailed on and put everything that the club's been working to not just this season but all the seasons beyond in jeopardy. That buys them absolutely zero forgiveness from me. So you know, drag them out and uh, strip them of their, of their of their contracts if you possibly can, and get rid of them. Although I, in a sense we'll be trying to sell them in January anyway. But it's the point that we're not talking about an infraction here. So when you say, or, or any of the guys are saying, um, or anybody listening is saying, "Oh, young guys, and and they've made a mistake," and you know, p- p- that happens. We're not talking about coming back late from a international game or turn up to training drunk or um, messing about with another player's misses or whatever, right? Uh, none of which I think is nice, by the way. <laughs> I don't think they're all like progressively a lot worse. Screw, say, I think, screw having you as a teammate. <laughs> right. Okay, I might have bought your misses, but, you know, at least I left alone your daughter. You know <laughs> that, what I mean? That's my Monday in the office. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so... What I'm saying though is that you can generally, <laughs> I might want to follow that out actually in future, right? But you, you might want to, you know, you can get round some of that because it's, you know, whatever. Um, with this, there's a global pandemic on. The protocols have been daily, almost hourly, given to these players. They know everything that's at stake. At stake. They know the transferring of, of the virus potential, etc., and what that means for self isolation, and therefore what it means for the squad and the team and playing games. And they put all that in the bin for what is, by and large, you know, a little bit of slap and tickle maybe um, at, at, a, at a party. There is absolutely no way that you can reflect that back and say, oh, do you know what, we give them another chance. No, if their brain cells are in short supply, then that's their problem. Rangers are bigger, the jersey's bigger, what we're trying to achieve is bigger. Best of luck, it's a really sad, sad moment for everybody, but you're going. That, that's it. There's a hard line drawn, and if we ever see John Jones or um, George Edmondson in a Rangers jersey again, I fully imagine it will be them, you know, doing some sort of legends, you know, cash grab because they shouldn't play for the first team ever again. I think you just have to respect the rules, respect the club, and respect the fans. Whether you agree with everything that's going on and everything like, just you've got rules set out there for a reason. Just respect the club enough to actually just follow them, and they did. And with that being said, that's us reached the end of this month's podcast and if you are still watching by the way drop us Sir Walter Smith down there in the comment section well let's see who the true channel legends actually are but before we wrap up the video in itself I just want to give a couple of thank yous out there first one to the gentleman that sat there and spoke about Rangers things with me for an hour so to Stevie, Tommy and David as always lads thank you so much the links will be down there in the description below so go ahead and give them a follow and as always I need to take a massive step back and thank you guys for taking the time of your day to sit here and listen to me talk about Rangers things hopefully you did get involved down there in the comments I look forward to interacting and replying to you there but as always I've been TJ Nova 92 thank you so much for watching all the best take care of yourselves and bye bye